Pakistan. This is Hedim Adi and this is our uh, uh, frequent English language uh, sessions with eminent personalities around the world, especially on current affairs and global affairs. Today, our guest is uh, Murtaza Hussain of Dropside News. Assalamu alaikum, Murtaza, and welcome to the program, sir. Welcome, Salam. Thank you for having me here. Thank you for uh, being here, Murtaza. Murtaza, uh, Dropside is again... Uh, created a, a major furor in Pakistan by publishing this story on the uh, base that has been given, apparently promised to China uh, in Gwadar. This story has created quite a bit of storm in, uh, in Pakistan, especially. I'm sure it has uh, created uh, raised eyebrows in the US as well. Uh, can you tell us a little more about how did you come about this uh, this information and what does it mean for Pakistan, for China-Pakistan relationships, for U.S.-Pakistan relationships, and for the regional power balance in uh, in Asia? Sure. So you know, for the past year, we've been covering Pakistan. Myself and Ryan, uh, our story has been based on, in this case documents, cables, reports, uh, interviews, uh, insider information from the Paki, Pakistani uh, security establishment. So that's how the story came about. And obviously there've been intense meetings between China and, the, and Pakistan uh, for many, many years in different formats about the issue of water. And I think the issue is now that Pakistan is trying to re rebuild its ties with America at the same time, it's trying to fix its ties with China, which have been damaged by this pivot. They've uh, done so much to placate the Americans that they've irritated the Chinese. Uh, and these documents kind of tell the story of that. And these interviews tell the story of that, uh, how it happened from the perspective of inside the Pakistani security establishment, uh, where many people are seemingly not happy about the current trajectory of policy and the results that's generated, which some have seen to be negative for Pakistan. So uh, now, um, am I understanding that the forces within uh, the security establishment, the sources within that, uh, may be sharing this news that because they are uh, upset that Pakistan would go to the extent of providing a permanent military presence to China and want to warn the world at large? maybe alert the Americans to this? Or is it because they believe that this is the right thing to do? Well, I think that the issue is that it's a big sacrifice of Pakistani sovereignty to do that, to give a base to a foreign country. Uh, it's very big step. And giving a base to America during the war on terror, you know, was very upsetting to many Pakistanis, especially when the inevitably it was used to kill some Pakistanis. So people didn't like that. Same reason Pakistan is a very nationalistic and patriotic, uh, it's a very divisive step to do that. Secondly, it would really harm Pakistan's ties with the United States if they were to give such a base. And the story tells the story of that as well, too. Uh, so it's a very significant step. It would be you know, very damaging in many ways to Pakistan's national integrity, arguably, and it also damage the ties with the US. But it's not really you know, the purpose of the story is not to say whether it's right or wrong, it's just to say this is happening. And really, it's not, not actually that they've started building the base or anything like that either. It's just that privately, because of the on the escalating Cold War between the U.S. and Pakistan, uh, sorry, U.S. and China, which Pakistan is kind of caught in the middle of, uh, it's having a very, very hard time balancing its relationships with these two countries. So now, because Pakistan's, mainly because Pakistan's economy is so bad, it ends up being very dependent on both of these relationships. Instead of having China and the US compete to get Pakistan on their side, uh, you instead have Pakistan basically selling off its assets, to national assets effectively, to placate America and to placate China. But this is really running out, this whole, they're going to such extreme steps and they're really giving water for not much potentially or, you know, it's a huge sacrifice. Maybe they should never give it, maybe. But uh, if they're going to give it, they should be a very high cost. Uh, they haven't made a deal with the Chinese about this, but because now they're negotiating a position of extreme stress, 
because the economy is collapsing, bills are not adding up, they need to renegotiate the debt. China is just waiting until this ripe uh, fruit of water just falls into its hands. That's unfortunately the problem. And if the Pakistan's economy was better, they would be in a much better position. They wouldn't have to negotiate about water. They could force America and force China both to compete, to give them more and more, to get them on their side. Just the way that the U.S. is giving so much to India these days because it wants it on its side against China. But Pakistan is not in that position, and it's really the economic dysfunction which is what's caused that. So uh, <clears throat> that's really interesting. Um, I mean, there's a common perception in Pakistan that the the U.S. and the Israeli Zionist lobby is out to denuclearize Pakistan, and once that happens, they will leave Pakistan alone. But it seems that the other big issue is China. So even if Pakistan were denuclearized, you know, China's um, economic juggernaut and with Gawadar being a major economic outlet to that, plus now a military naval base uh, changes this whole perception that, oh, once you're nuclear, denuclearized, you're okay, you can go and go about your own business. So this problem suddenly doesn't seem to be going away. Uh, how do you see this playing out if it really were to happen and China has a military naval base? What does it say about the region and the and the conflict between USA and China? So one interesting thing from these documents and this story is that uh, China really, really wants the space. It's not something that... Uh, it's just a nice to have for them. They're really pushing hard for this to happen. Uh, mm -hmm. And what, so why is that? Why do they want a military base in Guadalajara? Well, there's two reasons. First of all, 80% of Chinese energy flows now take place through the Strait of Malacca in the South China Sea. Uh, mm -hmm. It's easily blockadable in the case of a war with the U.S. The U.S. Navy and its allies could blockade the Strait of Malacca. And then basically, China would run out of energy pretty quickly thereafter. Uh, if they have water, they have an alternate channel. They want to diversify their supply chains for energy. So they have an altered channel from the Eastern oil uh, and other ship shipments uh, and their own goods to export. But also, uh, it gives them the opportunity to go on the offensive. So if they have water, what they can do is that they can, in the case of a war with the U.S., they can blockade the Strait of Hormuz. And the Strait of Hormuz obviously is very, very important to the U.S. for its own energy shipments to the West in general and much of the global economy in fact. So it's not just the China's on the defensive then. It can also go on the offensive. It can level the playing field with America. And you see this huge military buildup in China. It's giving them the opportunity to do that. If they have Guadalajara, they can keep attack submarines there. They can keep the surface ships there. They can uh, repair them. They can base them permanently. It's a very, very powerful change that would come about if they were to have water. So that really tells you why, I think, why they are so insistent on having water. Uh, I think it's because they want to be on equal footing with America, and they can't do that unless they have the ability to hit America in a war as hard as America can hit it, and also diversify as well its own weaknesses. Hmm. So from, from, from what you've said and from what I know of Pakistan and one, what we know of uh, a U.S. interests in the region, clearly the U.S. is not going to allow that. Even if, even if Pakistan were to give this permission and sign an agreement and in the next two or three years we see the development of a naval base with military equipment, military machinery, the U.S. is not going to allow that. So how do you think they're going to counter this? Well, you know, I don't really know what they can do. Uh, if China really wants it, and China is right next to Pakistan and America is far away, they can, you know, stop giving them IMF loans. They can stop cooperating with them. But Pakistan and America don't have much cooperation anymore, to be honest. Uh, and that's not really great for Pakistan in some ways because now it's become so dependent on China and its economy and the... Uh, lending and so forth it's better to at least have if you have multiple dependents it's a little bit better than having one dependent uh or one patron but i i don't think there's much they can do to stop it other than they could completely sever their ties with pakistan so what basically the pakistanis have asked for privately from the chinese is that if you want this to happen if you want us to give you water 
you need to give us a significant increase in economic and military support such that we can insulate ourselves from any backlash that would likely to be coming from the United States in terms of us completely more or less uh, igniting our relationship with the Americans. Now, that said, you know, maybe Pakistan, maybe Pakistani leaders are saying this to China because they want to set such a high cost that China would just not accept it. And, you know, so far, implementation of the Gwadar agreement has not worked because of the fact that China felt that Pakistan is asking too much. And maybe these asks are just a hint that they don't really have the stomach to go through with it because of what it would result in with the ties with the U.S. Uh, it's hard to say, but it's possible. And I, I think they'll try to continue playing this game as long as possible, trying to string both the U.S. and both China along as long as they can. But the issue, and this is what I'm trying to get out in the story, is that it's becoming impossible now. Because we give, if the relationship with them was between China and the U.S. was moderately hostile, then maybe you can keep doing this for a while. And even Americans say we don't want, we're not trying to force Pakistan to have a choose between either of us. It's not the issue. But if it gets worse and worse, which it looks like it is, and I think most experts, and I agree, it's going to get significantly more hostile between China and the United States. Pakistan will not be able to play both sides. They can't have to pick a side then. And in the Cold War, you cannot side with... Uh, both countries. You know, the US. Yeah. Exactly, right. And you won't be able to do this in this Cold War too. So interestingly, in Pakistan's own internal documentation, classified documents, they themselves conclude, the military concludes, that they have greater interest with China. And their interests with the U.S. are really not that much. It's pretty minimal, actually. Mm -hmm. They have not too many shared interests. There's strategic, uh, uh, you know, uh, mutual commonalities with the U.S. So really, it makes more sense to bandwagon with China if you have to bandwagon with somebody mm -hmm. from Pakistan's own interest. At the same time, this is not in the documents, but this is just something we can all observe. Uh, the Pakistani military culturally prefers the U.S. Uh, Pakistani elites prefer the U.S. They prefer the West. They have their assets and their apartments and their children in London and New York and, you know, D.C. They don't have them in Beijing. They don't speak Chinese Mandarin. They speak English. Uh, these are all super important. Uh, they're very painful. makes a very painful choice for them. And I don't know if they can even be able to sacrifice their own interests for the country's interests. I don't know if they're able to do that because, you know, as we've seen now with Russia and the Russia-U.S. conflict, if there's a big conflict, uh, Western countries will seize your assets. They'll seize the assets of powerful oligarchs and so forth in in the West. And I don't think there's no Sharif or you know what our generals have assets in the West. Do they want their assets to be seized or their apartments to be seized? Probably they will choose themselves as much as they can over the country. Uh, but it's getting very hard to do that. It's getting very, very hard to do because the Americans are not giving much. They're not giving much to Pakistan. They don't really care about Pakistan that much. It's not useful to them. They have Indians need Pakistan really to fight China. They have India to do that. They may give some minor, minimal concessions about a few things to for Pakistan to stay as neutral as possible, but they're not going to go give the patronage and support that Pakistan is hoping for. So really, rationally, you know, this is not my opinion. This is just the opinion of. Pakistani security establishment internally itself, they should stick with China. They're better off with China. It's just, can they actually do that, given their own personal interests? Hmm. So, so in a way, uh, this is a crossroads that Pakistan is at. And uh, uh, China would always tell Pakistan that they could have a relationship with them as well as the U.S., but the U.S. doesn't believe that uh, it, this can happen. So, so Pakistan will have to make a choice whether it's uh, China or it's it's the U.S. Um, so, going back to that earlier question, short of uh, stopping Pakistan getting aid from the IMF um, and the oligarchs like Nawaz Sharif mm -hmm. and their assets being uh, picked up by 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 the U.S., do you think the U.S. would make covert or overt military moves to thwart this? Well, this is the thing. We've seen that they have no uh, hesitance to make significant moves inside Pakistan to change the 
equation more favorably in their balance uh, when they need to. But it's very difficult to say. I don't see any evidence that they're planning to do that at the moment. And I also, you know, we have to say that they haven't actually gone forward and moved to irreversible steps to give water to the Chinese. They just promised it to them. They've concluded internally that they have to give it to them. And they've told basically Xi Jinping and the top leadership of the CCP that they're going to have it. And they are very drawing a very hard line that you have to give it to us. So that's the position they're in. They haven't actually, you know, done it. They haven't crossed the red line yet, but they might. And if they do that, maybe America will respond. But I don't think that America is the capacity to really stop this if the Fox side is really wanting to happen because yeah. it would just take too much. And, you know, I think. America knows that China is going to expand its footprint globally. You can delay it a little bit, maybe by regime change in Pakistan again, or other moves, economic pressure, threats, things like that. But I don't think you can really stop it. It's actually very interesting. And there's a U.S. Army War College report that cited a Chinese official talking about Guadar some years ago. He said that it's basically, I can't remember the, the metaphor he used, but he said it's a meal that's already been prepared and we can eat it when we want. So they, they are very confident that they'll get water one way or another, maybe take a bit longer, maybe come sooner, but it's going to happen. And I don't think there's much that the U.S. can do to stop it uh, if the Pakistanis agree to it. And really, they've also concluded, the U.S. side has concluded, we know this from talking to them and reading the information, that uh, Pakistan inevitably... You know, it's 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 in the orbit of China in some way. Uh, the strategic logic is such that it's there, and they don't. When a second that they decide to increase their political commitment to China, uh, there'll be nothing stopping the militarization of water. I think that's where we are now. Okay, so um, uh, it. I mean, to me, the what appears and looking at the past 30 years of history and the terrorism that's taken place in Pakistan, it's really very easy to ignite um, unrest in that part of Pakistan, Balochistan, with the Baloch insurgents, the Afghan, you know, guns for hire, anyone can go and pay them off and, and, and get a, you know, a bomb blast done. So uh, that perhaps may actually be uh, the route that the U.S. may ch choose to take, some clandestine, under-the-table type of uh, activities. Do you think they would do that? Well, you know, there's obviously the Baloch uh, Liberation Army in Balochistan, and it seems pretty clear, or many people have concluded, and there seems evidence for it, that at this point it's patronized by India. It's become basically India's version of Lashkar Taiba, you could say, in terms of... Uh, doing attacks in inside Pakistan. A uh, very brutal terrorist attacks now, escalating target civilians and so forth, and also targeting Chinese engineers in Pakistan. So specifically targeting CPEC and so forth. You can see a ramp up of those operations uh, conducted by RAW uh, inside Pakistan. Uh, that's not, uh, I think I would be very likely in fact, the more that China builds a footprint in there the more brutal the insurgency and counterinsurgency inside Balochistan will get. Uh, that's a very difficult situation for Pakistan because they already had problems in Balochistan before, some of them self-created by their own uh, actions there, which inflamed the population. And now it's being exploited by outside actors, at minimum India and who knows who else. So one thing that the Pakistanis have asked of China is that if you want Gwadar to be what you want it to be, uh, you need to help us, you know, create jobs, create stability in Balochistan, because that's where the port is. And without that, the security challenges will be such that it'll be very difficult to actually have a secure port and base there. And, you know, is Pakistan capable of, you know, developing Balochistan? Is China, with Pakistani support, capable of developing Balochistan? Uh, I don't know, but that's a very, very important prerequisite for any such a base, because if there's a big sensitive military base, big trade routes going through, you know, Balochistan to Gwadar, they're being attacked all the time. It's going to really make it a lot harder. And the Chinese are already very upset with this perceived security failures uh, of the Pakistani establishment inside Pakistan, killings of Chinese citizens. 
And as this has been sort of rumored about before, what we see in our story as well, too, is that they've asked Pakistan at the highest levels for the creation of joint security companies, mm. uh, Chinese Pakistani, that can operate inside Pakistan. So basically, Chinese boots on the ground inside Pakistan carrying out security operations. Hmm. So, so one last question on this, and I just want you to touch on this uh, escalating tensions in the Middle East and the uh, Pager War, then the Hezbollah attacks, and then the uh, IDF, uh, Israeli air, air bombardment. China's military budget, uh, you know, it, 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 from what one can see, on the net is anything between 400 to 500 billion dollars which is significantly higher than it was ever was in the past and uh it's no longer way behind the us 700 or 800 billion you know it's it's about 50 60 percent of the us budget in a in a conflict in the region do you uh do you see a Chinese US military confrontation in the Gulf, in the Straits of Hormuz, with Gawadar being one of the key jumping off points for the US for the Chinese? Well, uh, it's very difficult to say. What I will say is in the last couple of years, I've done a lot of reading and research and interviews to try to figure out the likelihood of the US. Chinese conflict, and I've specifically been trying to study ways to avoid it. And everything I've tried to learn about ways to avoid it, in my own personal observation, has convinced me more that it's actually inevitable and unavoidable. Because I don't. Think uh, it's that convinced you that it's actually inevitable conflict. It's unavoidable. It's an inevitable there. conflict. Okay. And, and by the way, the Pakistanis internally in their documents, they haven't said it's inevitable, but they believe it's highly likely that there will be a clash between. Uh, the U.S. and China, or at the very least, they've gamed this out as a very realistic uh, possibility that they're concerned about because it puts them in the middle. So I, in that case, anything could happen. I, I think that, you know, a Chinese D-Day style invasion of Taiwan is probably one of the less likely options, but certainly reciprocal blockades and attacks on shipping, uh, you know, aerial overflights of Taiwan, uh, again, blockading the Strait of Hormuz if Wadir is in play. Other confrontations navally, very, very possible, very likely. And China wants to be the ability to not just fight on their own turf, they want to fight on America's turf, in the Middle East too. So they need they need Wadir for that. They need that. And it really impresses on me because in the documents, when you, when you talk about the story to people publicly in the U.S. or elsewhere, Sometimes they don't really know what China thinks. They think, well, they don't really need water. They don't really want it that much. It's not that important. They have other trade routes they can use. But what I saw and what I know now is that they really want it. And they've been pushing very, very hard for it. Mm -hmm. And they don't want it for no reason. These are very intelligent people. They're very calculating. They're thinking far ahead. There's a reason they want water. And either it's to go on the offensive or it's to limit their own vulnerabilities or both. And I think it is both. I think that they want this. They're going to push very, very hard for this. And, you know, they could use it for that. And I, I think that, I don't know if there's going to be a huge full-scale war between the U.S. and China. There's going to be a great, great tension and great clash of some sort. Uh, because the world as it is right now is not accommodating enough to both sides. Uh, they, something needs to give. It's one side either needs to just surrender or there's going to be a competition. Hmm. So, so uh, every Pakistani feels that we're the center of the universe and all America is worried about is what's going on in Pakistan. But what really is the chatter in Washington, Murtaza? Well, you know, it's interesting you bring that up because really in Washington, it's very little discussion of Pakistan. And, you know, even the stuff that's been going on the past year and a half, the cipher, all these things, there's decisions which are in many cases outsourced or delegated to lower level officials in the State Department. Uh, so, you know, you have people making policy who are not very important in Washington, but they're taking very important in Islamabad. They're taking their words, they're taking so seriously in Islamabad, too seriously almost. Really, people are not discussing Pakistan ever since the war in Afghanistan started to draw down. Uh, there's not really much. Pakistan on the agenda in DC. 
but also, you know, I would say that it's interesting, even the media coverage, it's basically just me and Ryan and, you know, one or two other people who are covering Pakistan, the New York Times, so forth, not even covering this country of 250 million people. Uh, that tells you something about the, because they, they kind of respond to elite uh, demand uh, in some sense for mm. information about something. There's not really much going on with Pakistan. And I'll tell you the real reason for this, if you ask me, is that Pakistan is economically irrelevant to the global economy, unfortunately. And, you know, it's not, it could be otherwise, it's very, that's potential to be otherwise. But because so much of the world is now based on, you know, control of these uh, connectivity, economic connectivity is such an important part of it. Pakistan's not plugged into it. They, be, they Because the economy is basically controlled by a small handful of elites, it's very consumption driven, it's not production based. Uh, the military has such a stranglehold over it. They don't let private enterprise grow in the talents of the Pakistani people to be realized. Uh, even maybe 10% of the population, if they had the opportunity, that'd be enough, actually. Even in India, it's not most people. It's a small number of people who also even drive the economy. If they had that, you'd see a lot more discussion about Pakistan, D.C. People oh. pr- you know, competing to be in Pakistan's good books. Like, they compete to get India on their side. That's the big problem. And I think a lot of changes, I don't know what else will change. And interestingly, this Gwadar story, maybe the Pakistani military likes it in some way because it shows that, you know, they still have a card to play, at least. And they're thinking of cards to play strategically. But really, it's not a card you want to play. You don't want to be selling off your sovereignty or forcing, you know, other countries to compete for your sovereignty. That's not what you want. You want to be them competing to have access to trade deals with you and things like that, things which are renewable resources. Mm. So this is really bad for them, really, actually. But uh, no, there's not really much discussion. Um, there's limited, there's some coverage, but limited coverage in the media, what's going on there. And, you know, until that changes, I don't think, and I, I, if I was in Islam, but I wouldn't, uh, be waiting around or thinking really hard about what people in DC are saying, because they're not thinking about you that much. They're not thinking hmm. about you that much at all. But, yeah. It really comes back to this, uh, fundamental question of, um, uh, economy and, uh, perhaps the only way out for Pakistan to be able to assert itself and save its sovereignty is to have uh, the military withdraw, Imran Khan come out, have a, you know, mandated participative government uh, and and work on the economy. Maybe that's the only solution. And maybe that's uh, the U.S.'s best bet, as well as China's best bet, is to have a full-blown participative democracy in Pakistan with the military taking a back seat. Is that kind of a... Uh... That, that'd be great, but the problem is there are some people, a small number of people who the current system works very well for, and they get very rich off the way things are right now. Those people would have to be co- compelled to let go of their grip on the Pakistani economy. Many of them are in the military, actually, too. Uh, you know, Absolutely. These elite, uh, feudal mm. families and military elites and so forth. It's a consumption-based economy, which is not what mm. you want to be when you're a developing country. It's, mm. it's, you see the consumption of Western luxury goods and beautiful houses and all these things. It's very They want to live a lifestyle which is not appropriate to the condition of the country as a whole. And everyone else has suffered. The country suffers as a whole, too. Take a look mm. at South Korea. South Korea created these big uh, chai bowl enterprises. Many, many decades ago, Pakistan and South Korea equal GDP per capita. They were both equally poor. South Korea went like this, Pakistan has gone like this. It hasn't really done much. So mm. they create these enterprises, you know, uh, public-private enterprises that allow state-state uh, protected private enterprises, you could say, which grow, participatory, you know, meritocratic and so forth. And they can create the foundation for an economy. There's a lot of smart people in Pakistan, a lot of talented, hardworking people that can put them to work. Uh, but they don't seem to have any ideas. And I think that also the problem is the militaries around the world, including Pakistan, they don't really know how to run an economy. They're not military officers not trained in running an economy. I think the military in the in Pakistan doesn't even know how to run its own institution, Murtaza, let alone politics and, and governance. I mean, I know the institution very well. Uh, they literally run their own institution to the ground. Uh, yeah. it, it's no longer a military machine. It's just, a, uh, you know, I, I hate to say this, uh, you know, publicly now, especially because there's an English-speaking audience that'd be uh, watching this. Uh, it's the world's biggest mafia gang, 
literally. Yeah, they're, yeah. They're, they're, they're devoid of values, they're devoid of professionalism, they're devoid of human decency. They've crossed all lines uh, in their march towards fascism and violence. It's a horrible, horrible, uh, it, it's a it's a Dr. Jekyll, Mr. Hyde story, you know. It's a it's a beast gone berserk. So, uh, but thank you for this wonderful insight onto the Gawadar. So the question of the Middle East, and I know we're running out of time, but your quick take on what's going on. Well, you know, interestingly, if you'd asked me yesterday, I would tell you that Israel seems to have given Hezbollah a very stunning blow, and I don't know if they could even recover from what happened. The, the pager attack was devastating, really, and I think maybe there's rumors that the impact would be worse than publicly knowledge. I'm not sure if that's true or not, but certainly it was a very wide impact, even from what we've seen. I think several dozen people were killed, maybe hundreds were blinded or had lost thousands, maybe lost hands or fingers and things like this. The psychological blow was devastating. And the next day to do it again with the walkie-talkies uh, is just a very, very sophisticated operation. And then the day after that, they assassinated the entire uh, leadership of the Red Wan force, which is Hezbollah's elite uh, force, which was allegedly tasked with the invasion plan of northern Israel in the case of a war. And they killed a very, very senior official, Ibrahim Akil, one of the top officials of Hezbollah. So I was wondering if Hezbollah even had the capacity to respond after all that. And last night they did respond, actually. And they expanded the scope of their fire uh, to points in Israel they've never hit before. Uh, never Haifa, military bases outside Haifa, air bases, long-range missiles, heavier payloads of missiles. So it's shown actually that it's a very resilient organization. And even these really devastating, stunning blows have not been enough to uh, stop it and to do what Israel wants, which is to make them withdraw from the border so that the Israeli citizens can return to northern Israel. Uh, I think the only way to stop this now is if there's a ceasefire in Gaza, which Israel doesn't want. So I think there's also no out, there's no way out of this situation either, because anyone who agrees to ceasefire now, or agrees to the end of the war now, uh, they, which is what Hamas wants, Israel would be seen as, in their eyes, losing the war if they were to do that. Mm. So they don't want to do it. They want to cave. But at the same time, they can't defeat Hezbollah by the air. So the one thing they may have to do, which they don't want to do, is invade Lebanon again. It's never gone well for them to invade Lebanon. They take huge casualties. They're fi still fighting in Gaza. It's a huge economic drain, a strain on society and so forth. It'll weaken them a lot. That's the situation they're in now, though. Because Hezbollah is not... Uh, even after these devastating blows, of such that has never happened in the history of the organization, uh, they've shown themselves to be very resilient. They have an ability to bounce back that surprising to many people, given the losses they've taken. And that's really put Israel in a very, very difficult situation now. And I think the invasion of Lebanon is not impossible. I think it's quite likely if I were to bet. Iran, do you think Iran will jump into the fray? Hezbollah is very important to Iran because Hezbollah defends Iran and its nuclear program. And, you know, it's one of the purposes of it. It's a shield for Iran against attack against itself. It's a play card they've spent 30 years building up. Uh, are they going to attack directly? They don't like to get involved directly they, because they don't want the war. They don't want their own soldiers to die. They don't want the war to be brought to their own country, ideally. So they would resist that. But I think if Hezbollah, they assessed it was in a very dire position that it was not going to survive. They may have to because as they see it, and I see uh, their own internal communication. Oh, sorry. I, they're... You know, what they say in, to, amongst themselves on their own channels and so forth in Persian, they say that Hezbollah goes, then Iran goes. If Hezbollah is destroyed, then Iran will be destroyed. That's a view that a lot of them have. So if that's their view, then they would act sooner than later. Uh, in the manner they do that remains to be seen, but maybe ballistic missile attacks again against Israel, but targeted such that they do not... Uh, they, they get around the Iron Dome this time. They were not targeted really? to do that last time. But also the problem is, I think that Iran might be already be, will be fighting Israel today, but the entire, every U.S. carrier group has been moved from the South China Sea to the Middle East now, specifically to threaten Iran and threaten Hezbollah, that if you retaliate too much against Israel, uh, we'll get them to fight as well too. So the U.S. presence really changes a lot of things. Um, that's so really, they, they, the, the 
evergreen question. Will this escalate into a regional conflict? Will we'll rope in the Gulf countries, Pakistan, other other countries? Well, I wonder what Pakistan will do at this point, because Pakistan is so eager to get back in America's good books right now. They don't want to put this on the line if they were to side with the... Maybe they prefer Pakistan's side with America in this situation, or at least at the minimum be neutral in the situation. And I think in previous generations of Pakistani leaders were very uh, eager to be involved in this, this conflict. But, you know, the Sunni Gulf Arab states are now, you know, either pro-Israel or just trying to stay out of it. So I think Pakistan will tend to follow Saudi Arabia's position, whatever it does, and the UAE's position, whatever it does. They're trying to keep their heads down and stay out of it. Mm. Because if a few missiles land in Dubai or in Saudi Arabia, that's the end of their whole economic uh, yes. program. It that's re- it. Re- requires total security. And it'll, everyone will leave. It'll just be over. Yeah. They can't afford that. They try to keep their heads down and have this not happen. Uh, so I think Pakistan will take that view as well, too. Uh, but, you know, mainly the it'll be the Shia militia groups that Iran has created the network around the Middle East, which are getting wider and wider every year. Iraq, Yemen, Syria, Lebanon. Uh, there's those groups, and it could be Iran itself. It could be Iran itself. And then, that, that would be a significant uh, significant change. And I think it's almost, I wouldn't say it's likely, but it's, it's very difficult to avoid this in a long time, I think. Rather difficult to what, sorry? It would be difficult to avoid this outside of a, another agreement mm. between the U.S. and Iran, like a nuclear deal. But I don't think any deal like that is possible anymore, unfortunately. Oh, okay. okay. What's up? Thank you very much. Really appreciate that, especially the insight on, on Gawadar. I think we're very clear. Uh, Pakistan is at a uh, you know, crossroads on our decision. Uh, your insight about the Middle East, uh, extremely useful. Uh, you've always, you and Ryan, and even at the Intercept and now here, uh, you, you guys are generally, you know, spot on with your analysis and your information is amazingly accurate. Keep doing the good work and I would like to advise uh, and recommend uh, and humbly submit to our viewers and listeners, please subscribe to Dropside. Uh, it's the only mainstream alternate media channel in North America that actually reports on Pakistan and extremely objectively and uh, uh, with, with, with head and heart both. So please subscribe, please support this channel. Yes, What's up? Thank you very much. Good luck. Thank you so Good much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.